us today, I have Dr. Hathaway. He is a clinical psychologist who received his doctorate in clinical psychology at Bowling Green State University. His clinical training led him to service as a clinical psychologist for the United States Air Force for seven years. After his military service came to an end, Dr. Hathaway completed a postdoctoral fellowship in clinical child psychology with Russell Barkley at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center ADHD Clinic, the leading research clinic for ADHD. Following his fellowship, Hathaway joined Regent in its new Christian psychology program. Since then, Dr. Hathaway has enjoyed the responsibility and privilege of training future psychologists and counselors, calling Regent the ideal community of Christian scholars in which he can continue to pursue his passion for lifelong learning and Christian service. He has recently been promoted from Dean of the PsyD program to the Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs. Dr. Hathaway, thanks for joining us today. Uh, good to be here. Thank yeah, you. It's a real pleasure. Um, so I've just been kind of starting these off with kind of uh, just, can you tell us uh, where did your interest in psychology first begin? So, you know, psychology is a pretty new discipline. So there's a lot of different psychologies, depending on what era you approach this field in and who you approach it with. So in my early years, I was really drawn to science. So okay. Boy Scout Merit Badge is in a state university, small town. So I'd go do metallurgy, run the astronomy observatory at the local college when I was ninth grade. And we do things like this just out of interest. That was before there were Xboxes and uh, you know the online world to keep us preoccupied. So you'd go out and do other kinds of explorations. Um, as I became a Christian in my mid-teenage years, I started to feel a call more to work with people as opposed to uh, chemicals in a lab. So mm. it's not that Christians shouldn't do natural science, but it's just how God was leading me. Uh -huh. My sister was finishing her social work degree and had a number of psych books laying around the house. And so I picked them up and with three TV channels, you quickly saturated your <laughs> mindless diversions. Uh, and so remember just reading through some of those. That was the heyday of behaviorism. And I was drawn to the more sciencey part of psychology. That was fascinating to me. Our scoutmaster was the chair of the psych department at that state university. So I you know, sort of bug him about questions took an AP, what would now be AP, AP didn't exist back then, a high school psychology course. And that further kind of moved me in that direction. Still planning to just do ministry and not go to college from a blue collar factory kind of background. About a year into doing that after high school, I became clear that I really needed a college degree to have credibility in the kinds of things I wanted to do in the community, which were really reaching out to people who were uh, disaffected in various ways. So that was my motivation to go to college and get a psychology degree with the intent, intention still going back into kind of street ministry. However, in college, as I knew, learned more about psychology, I really developed a passion for it as a distinct discipline and felt called to pursue it. So that kept me on that path uh, really for about 12 years. So from undergrad through uh, grad school and then my internship uh, so it was a little over a decade journey through to my doctorate. What is it, uh, like you said, psychology has many branches. What is it that drew you to the clinical psychology portion? Well, I did want to help people. So uh -huh. that was the field that seemed most obvious. Uh -huh. uh, we had several doctoral programs at Bowling Green State where I did my graduate work. We had industrial organizational psychology, people that work with you know, consulting roles in industry and uh -huh. uh, in engineering. We had... Uh, social psychology doctorate, a child developmental doctorate. Uh, we had an experimental doctorate that heavily emphasized both psychobiology and and uh, cognitive uh, cognitive psychology kinds of uh -huh. themes. Then we had clinical, but we all took the same basic science courses together in these different doctoral programs. I remember one day the professor joked, "Okay, so you I/O psychologists are in here because you want to own the world. They get the big consulting fees." Uh -huh. You experimental psychologists are in here because you want to tinker with the world mm -hmm. and you clinical psychologists are in here because you want to save the world. And <laughs> it's sort of true in a way. I mean, we, we did have this interventionist mindset, although we were a very different kind of group of people, but 
we all were interested in doing something to make a difference in the world. And mm. for me, that was a Christian motivation in part that took me in that direction. Mm. And yet it was rooted in science. So this was a research program. Uh, one of our professors was inventing the field of the psychology of emotion, really effective neuroscience. He came up with that title. Oh. Doing based, my two office mates were both TAs and the experimental program, and they were doing brain dissection studies in animals to figure out what the basic circuitry of emotions were. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of stuff that was in the air while I was being trained and really the, the harder science type aspects of psychology. And that fit well with my early childhood interests. So that drew me in this direction. Um, mm -hmm. In a clinical sense, it's helping people in a way where you know you're really helping them, like measured outcomes using methods that have some evidence behind them. Mm -hmm. That would come to be called by the 1990s evidence-based practice. But mm -hmm. back then we were just thinking of ourselves as using science to help people. It's yeah, a, it's a motivation. And so like uh, for myself, I, well, I don't think I would have gotten accepted to a PhD program anyways, but for PsyD, my my main emphasis was I, I was not that interested in the research side of things. I just wanted to practice. Mm -hmm. And and then you have um, people that go through the program and then they they realize, oh, uh, maybe I don't want to be a therapist. I want to do testing or they go all these different routes. Yes. Um, for you, was it was it research driven? Was uh, what did you think about therapy? What about testing? What about those routes? So I thought about a research career and I did have an interest in it, uh, mm -hmm. but I really wanted to, I started this again from a motivation for ministry, independent of psychology. So I really wanted to get back to helping people. Mm -hmm. I think one way to think about this is the difference between laboratory science and field science. Uh -huh. So field scientists use science to do real world applications in the field. So engineers may build bridges that have never been built a certain way before with longer suspension than anyone's ever built. So they have to figure out how to structure it, what kind of materials will work, right? They have to know the science and also the practical constraints they're operating under, uh, probably some budget that's limited rather than spending whatever they want to, to, to have the perfect solution. Uh, the two actually come out with a tangible real world result. And in a field like that, the results are really obvious. So if, if the bridge falls down and people you know die mm. it didn't work right? <laughs> so if it stays out for a long time then you've got some success and so in our field i think what i was interested in is really being able to make a difference beyond just people's speculations or subjective impressions and mm -hmm. so research for me always had an applied or practical concern mm -hmm. and i felt when during those years i was a full-time clinician I was just as much engaging things from a kind of research perspective as I was when I was a um, when I was in academics doing research projects for my graduate work. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what evidence based practice at its best is. Mm -hmm. Again, we have pragmatic constraints we have to operate under. So if you remember the old TV show House, that's someone who really had a researcher's heart mm -hmm. as a clinician. And it wasn't feasible. He kept busting the hospital budget, taking too long to do diagnoses, but it led him to a more thorough picture of how to help people than he would have had using standard medicine. The practical reality is we can't practice that way in healthcare. It's too costly. So we do have to take some shortcuts. We can't use cutting edge science with every person as though it were a novel research investigation. Mm -hmm. We often don't need to, but Still, if you have at least some of that mindset, then you know when you need to do something more than the typical three tests to study something, right? You can you can apply it to the situation. And that kind of thinking really stayed with me in my clinical practice and found it very helpful. And I don't think you need to be a science person that is intent on a research career to do that. So I would hope that all of psychology has that kind of local clinical science kind of mindset as it's been described by some people that's what makes us different from the other mental health professions where they aren't anchored in that kind of a discipline yeah that makes sense and so did you ever think about having a private practice or what did you think about therapy and so i did a lot of therapy in the military particularly in my first assignment after internship I was the only base psychologist so oh. my routine day was 
you know, coming in at 7.30 in the morning, there'd be some walk-in security clearance screenings. Uh, so I may do four or five of those, then starting around eight or nine, I would have my hourly session. Sometimes I'd block out a morning for assessments, but I would see just patients back to back. Um, and that would go on for months, you know, without much break during those years. I also covered every third week we took shifts. There was a psychologist a psychiatrist and a social worker were the, the mental health team at that base. Each week, each, every three weeks, we took a shift covering the ER. So we did the emergency screenings, that sort of thing. So a lot of clinical contact and experience, and I pretty much saw everyone. Now, these days, because of the pace of the war and terror and its impact, um, the military facilities are largely closed down to dependents. And so if you go into the military, for the most part, you'll likely only be seeing active duty folks. But back then I was seeing uh, children, spouses, retirees. So pretty much a community psychologist yeah. seeing the full spectrum of what was in that small Southern community where I was assigned as the only base psychologist. Uh, and I enjoyed that. So really I was at the point of deciding on a military career where I would have stayed clinical. I had my line number promotion to major if i would have accepted it i would have owed them a couple more years which would have put me over halfway to military retirement mm. um, but really felt more called to teaching in academia um, but it was a tough call for me so i enjoyed the clinical work yeah i imagine um especially with what got you into it being kind of service to the population and um you you know you said you ca carried over from your ministry studies. And so what was the thought process like going from seeing clients on an everyday basis to getting into academia? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I started with that fellowship, which was at a research clinic. Now I did see clients there, but as part of a randomized NIMH funded clinical trial. Mm. And so that was research, but doing clinical work. Um, and then I was going clearly to an academic position after that. Um, but at Regent, I came as the director of clinical training and also the supervisor for their uh, new training clinic in the program. The second year was in existence. Okay. So I was able to really draw on that clinical background. I also uh, joined a local clinical practice and saw clients for about a day and a half mm -hmm. for those first five or six years mm -hmm. um, okay. that I was at Regent. So I continued to fairly significant part-time practice. So yeah. quite a bit in the early years until my administrative duties made it more difficult to do that. Um, so um, it was a shift. What I found though, is that the amount of things and the type of things I was able to do in the military and on my postdoc kept me fresh with clinical stories for students for really that whole period up until probably about 2010. And then even though I still do a little bit of dabbling every once in a while, forensic case I've done most recently, but I don't really see clients anymore. Mm -hmm. I started to feel more rusty. So I'm specialty by specialty training. I'm a clinical child psychologist, Okay. but I haven't given the newest version of the WISC. So I've been an administrator too much in this latest season. Uh -huh. And so, so definitely I'm too rusty to quite tell you on what all the cutting edge stuff, but uh -huh. when I came, it kept me fresh for quite a while and that I felt good about that as a clinical training instructor, being able to bring real world stories to bear on our cases. It's nothing wrong with being trained and going right into academia. A number of professors do. However, I do think there is something about being heavily involved in private practice where you learn things that the textbooks don't teach you. Mm. Little procedures, little techniques, little aspects of surviving as a practicing psychologists that it's important for our students to know, especially in a practitioner based program. And so I found that a helpful transition. Yeah, um, we I was just talking with some of my cohort mates about how valuable it is when we our professors bring in real world experience and apply yeah. it to the courses, it just makes it so much more real. Yeah. It, it is valuable. And I mean, the idea of clinical that term comes from medicine. The clinical method of medicine, a phrase used going back to the 1800s, comes from a word that means bedside. And so mm -hmm. the idea was that you're being trained at the bedside of the patient or where the patient is. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about the older medical school model where you do rounds 
and you see the person and you see it modeled and then you're asked to do it under demonstration with someone there who knows what you're doing and give you feedback. Mm -hmm. That's really the core of the clinical method. Now, we don't do it quite that way, but we do parts of them. That's why we have practicas, internships, those kinds of things. Yeah. And I do think it's better when we have folks. Now, all of our folks have had enough experience to be vetted into the field, at least at an entry practice level. That's what our APA accreditation requires. So they will have had experience and full-time experience for at least a year on internship. Uh, but but still, there's more to be learned about the real world than that. Yeah. And and I'll, I'll just... For how long has the clinical psychology program here at Regent been around? So it started in 96, and 96. I came in 97. So okay. How has it been for you to see? Uh, has it been a, a really good um, progress? Has there been ups and downs? Has it been steady? So I think it's been a good steady evolution but yes there have been seasons and those seasons are it, it feels strange to me now because i still think of myself as that young college student right but <laughs> but uh we've been here long enough to see people complete entire cycles of their career and mm. go through the normal changes that faculty do you hire someone right out of grad school they go all the way to full professor and then they kind of move on somewhere in their senior stage of their career that happens routinely in higher ed but as i was part of that early team building the program where we were all young and just figuring out wondering what it would be like when we were apa accredited and we had good internship placement rates with everyone succeeding and now we've been there now for quite a while yeah. and so there's generational shifts that happen plus there's shifts in the field you know differences in how psychology approaches things and uh, as those things evolve it's interesting to to just reflect. I think the program has a really good foundation and some great people in it. I do think it's finding its pace now and its new generation. And, uh, and that's just a normal kind of thing that happens. I was just thinking the other day about my father started a June, uh, he started a pony league team in between little league and sort of high school level sports uh, in baseball in our, in a, he started the league in our hometown. And so I grew up uh, as a young person going out on Saturday mornings, helping to line fields with him, getting them ready, making sure the fences were upright and you know, sitting out in the dugout while he took these kids through practices. And then eventually I got old enough to be on his team. Nice. So I saw a lot of cohorts of students go or athletes go through that pony league process. Uh -huh. And I remember he would sometimes have like the lead team that win the, the championship, but then they would kind of all age out. Mm. And then he'd have to rebuild the team again. And he would uh -huh. look for people with specific skill sets that he could cultivate, uh -huh. even though he knew it would be a year or two before they'd be back into mm. being a winning team. But he would, he kind of rebuilt his team three or four times while I was a young person watching it, you know, uh -huh. so um, it's a bit like that with doc programs, right? Mm -hmm. So you, uh -huh. you launch a program, it comes of age, and then uh, people retire or they they move on in normal developmental pathways and you rebuild it we're we have a good healthy foundation again we've been restructured by dr rowan under the new standards of accreditation mm -hmm. but now we're moving into a new season of what that will look like with the era we're in now and yeah. i think we're seeing healthy things happen um but it'll just be we're in a kind of um revisioning stage i think yeah yeah, so much change. Even even just thinking about with COVID and then the, yeah. the whole boom of telehealth and how that's changing our program and yeah. PSC. Yeah, so a lot of interesting things happening. Those things were big impacts for us, but I will say I think our institution handled that better than most. I'm on the Commission on Accreditation, so I had a snapshot of how our field is dealing with this, but because Regent has such strengths in online education, even though the CID program's never been because it, it, it's uh -huh. an on-campus program, uh -huh. we were able to draw on skill sets that were already there in the department. So I don't think, it's not the way we want to do the DOC program, yeah. but I don't think when we had to do online aspects of it, we were on as much of a learning curve as a number of our peer programs were. Mm. Yeah, it was a quite seamless transition. It made it really good. Yeah. Um, can we kind of go back to, can you tell us about your time at the University of Massachusetts with 
Dr. Barkley? Yeah, so Russ was actually a graduate of the program at Bowling Green. He was oh. kind of a legend. So you, you have to think, you have to imagine this because you probably can't relate to it, but he of course was going through grad school in a pre-word processing era. Okay, so he's someone who accelerated and got through our entire four-year pre-doctoral study in three years. Uh, and then he also um, did dissertation on ADHD with some of the toughest professors at the university. Mm. Uh, and he had this reputation. So he would um, be given revisions or comments from his committee on his manuscript. He would rewrite the entire thing that night and type it by a manual typewriter, <laughs> have copies and have it to their desk the next day. Wow. And he got his dissertation done like in lightning speed. And then he went off and started, you know, doing research clinical work. And he, uh, he was on the DSM-3, 3R4 committees that helped devise the standards for ADHD uh -huh. um, and, di and the disruptive behavior disorders. Uh -huh. And so Russ was just a remarkable scholar. And I had run into him a few places, but in the 90s, ADHD was kind of for a while there, the fad disorder. Uh -huh. Like before that, it was borderline, then autism after that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it was invalid, but it means everyone was suddenly interested in this topic. Yeah. The book Driven to Distraction came out from the two psychiatrists who had the specialty clinic for people with severe ADHD. Um, this was a hot topic. And in the military, we were getting folks coming and saying, I think I have ADHD, please assess me. This is happening so much, even though by standard guidance in the military, ADHD was a disqualifying condition for the military if you had to go on stimulant medication, people were still coming forward. And it was happening so much, the military needed guidance on it. So I was an Air Force psychologist working at the largest military hospital in Europe, which was an army hospital. The army sent me to the Cape Cod trainings to with Russ Barkley to, uh, to figure out a protocol for their adult ADHD assessments. Oh. And while I was there, Russ talked about this research postdoc he had I, so I applied for it. I also applied for the Air Force to fund it as a as an AFIT, meaning Air Force Institute of Technology Fellowship. If they would have, I would have still been on active duty and owed them time when I was done. I would have stayed as a military psychologist. They decided not to fund any clinical child. I didn't owe them any more time, so I turned down the major promotion and just went off to the postdoc. <laughs> That's the long and short of that story of why I drew, was drawn to that mm -hmm. and what led me there. But going back to an intense postdoc when you've got seven years of clinical experience, mm. I was already by that point, postdocs were becoming an immediate post degree kind of thing, mm. like they are for medicine. Uh -huh. Before that, it was something people often did later in their career. So I was a little bit more experienced than some people do tend, tend to be when they go on postdocs. Yeah. Still, it was, I decided I was gonna be in a student role so I took the pay cut to be a postdoc and I, you know, my wife took a job to help make up for it with teaching mm -hmm. and uh, we, we went through that experience, but it was great. I mean, so to do these protocols, I mean, it was my early experience with uh, doing randomized clinical trial research. Okay. So every session was taped. We had these two protocols we were comparing. One was 18 sessions that involved nine sessions of parent training based on behavioral management theory mm -hmm. for parents with a teenager who has ADHD and also a conduct or oppositional defiant disorder. Okay. The other was um, 18, 18 sessions of just problem solving communication training, a behavioral family systems approach. So we had these two different protocols. Each session had to be compliant with the design for the therapy. It was taped and there were compliance auditors that reviewed a, the tapes. And they would indicate if we were in compliance or not. So I was always in compliance, but I will tell you, there were never two clients I remember treating exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. So yes, we did the same things you're supposed to do in the session, yeah. but the way you brought them home, the way you related to them, the way you processed it really was specific to the client. Mm -hmm. okay. Maybe more comfortable with what some people call quick, quick therapy. Uh -huh where they, they mean that pejoratively, like, okay, you follow the script and it means you treat people like they are all the same when they're not. That's mm. actually a bad use of manualized therapy. Mm. Just like a physician learns the steps to do an appendectomy, 
But if you just had to mechanically perform the same incisions, since people's bodies are slightly different, they'd be miscutting some people, right? Mm -hmm. so, so they have to adjust the protocol, but they don't look for the appendix in the shoulder. I mean, so there are some things that are standard yeah. and there's some things they have to vary to the person. That's what good evidence-based treatments do. Mm -hmm. So they, you have to know when to do both. Uh, and that was really a great experience. Also, because we were the primary research clinic for ADHD, we had folks come out to consult with us. This is in the pre-Chavez days, but we had a delegation from Venezuela come, a delegation from India, a psychologist from Tel Aviv, from uh, Israel at the clinical child program there. And they would come to find out how we were doing ADHD assessments. Mm -hmm. What we found in India and in Venezuela when public school systems were evolving where everyone had to stay in school, the ADHD problems became more of a thing. Mm. With a few exceptions, the numbers were pretty similar world over. So regardless of whether or not a culture had an ADHD consciousness, when you require people to sit in a classroom and focus all day on work that isn't particularly interesting yeah. to 10-year-olds, uh -huh. you see in human nature a continuum spread of the ability to self-regulate mm. and keep yourself on task when the situation doesn't hold your attention like intelligence it's a kind of a bell curve shaped thing uh -huh. that upper three to five percent is where we tend to find the folks with adhd and so regulation deficits they just it's harder for them to do that mm. well, if you're in a culture where if you're not inclined to do well with those kinds of tasks you just don't stay in school and no one tracks it no one thinks about it which was true even here in the us until the mid 20th century then ADHD is a sort of hidden disorder, right? Mm. But if you are, if you're in a culture where everyone has to use the skill set that they're particularly challenged at, mm. then the problems become evident. So that's what we were finding as we consulted with countries that were now just enforcing kind of universal schooling expectations is they were finding now suddenly an ADHD problem. Yeah, that's, um, so I wanted to ask you, I, I saw this video in the, this guy, a psychologist was talking about this uh, researcher named, I think it's Panksep, Panksep. Yeah, um, yeah. So he found that with like with rats, with young rats, if you prevent them from rough and tumble play, that their prefrontal cortex doesn't mature very well. Yes. And that you can, you can help accommodate that with Ritalin. And I was going to ask about that with children and with ADHD. Yeah, so Pangsep was our psychobioprof. He was on Russ's committee, and oh, Pangsep okay. recently know. died, unfortunately. But he his mm. his career interest was on the psychology of emotion. He was not a clinician, but his theory about ADHD is that these are animals, and when you use an animal model mm. or humans, um, that that have underdeveloped their self-regulation abilities and he thinks that free play is really important mm -hmm. for the development of that it does seem to be important for the development of certain kinds of social skills uh, i've talked specifically about this with russ since they were you know both people that uh -huh. were connected dr barkley doesn't buy that particular explanation of the ideology of play he's mm -hmm. not seeing the data uh, of play as deficits or certain kinds of socialization deficits as the explanation for the etiology of of, um, of ADHD, but it's an interesting idea. Yeah. I, I do think, though, there might be something to uh, frustration control. I, this is a guess. It's a speculation as it was for Yag. Mm -hmm. um, why do so many people have trouble holding things back? We certainly engaged in a lot of rough and tumble play when I was young. Yeah. Um, I hear stories about my father's generation and the Depression, and they, you know, <laughs> They would settle things if they got too too problematic with a fist fight, mm -hmm. but no one like seriously injured each other, right? You know, they but yeah. you know, if, if someone hits you, your temptation is not to can have a controlled response. Mm -hmm. So it takes some work to learn to restrain those impulses. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder sometimes if our culture so inhibits impulses, acting on impulse, that kids never learn to self-regulate a heated kind of feeling mm. okay, i'm not saying go out and have your kids box or do mma in preschool but uh but I, what i'm saying is that's possible that's a speculation i don't think that's the story for adhd though i think mm. adhd people are probably more vulnerable to dysregulation in any kind of context and so if they don't learn 
how to socialize their play. Mm. They're going to have more problems than other people would, but everyone has under socialized um, development is going to have socialization problems. Yeah, that makes sense. The You talk about the vulnerability of some kids with ADHD. And I also, I was reading about uh, personality styles. Like if, if you think of the ocean model, um, like kids who are high in openness, extroversion and neuroticism, but then low in conscientiousness and agreeableness, and you put them in a classroom, that's really going to show, right? Yeah. And so, but could that be ADHD? I think the difference mm. is you can have those styles, uh -huh. but if you can check yourself, if you need to, mm -hmm. then you probably don't have ADHD. Okay. So the person with ADHD, regardless of their personality style, has less difficulty restraining themselves. They're more vulnerable mm. to situational control. I so see. another thing we often heard parents say to us is, you say that this is an attention deficit disorder, but if they're playing their video game, I can have a nuclear bomb go off behind their head and they don't <laughs> flinch. Uh -huh. so they don't seem to have any problem focusing when they want to. Well, that's precisely what ADHD is. It's not a, it's not a spotlight problem where you mm. have a problem focusing on something. It's a problem of controlling the spotlight, of you regulating it away from the situation that draws your interest. I see. So all of us would rather play the game than get up to eat something if we're not hungry or go take out the trash. Uh -huh. um, but if we know that we need to do it or people are going to be upset with us and there's going to be problems, we stop ourselves, go do it, and then come back, right? Uh -huh. The person with ADHD can't do the disengagement for the less interesting thing. So when they're sitting in class, one of the criteria for ADHD in the DSM is freedom from distraction. Mm -hmm. They're easily distracted, right? Uh -huh. It's easy for them to go on rabbit trails because um, like that dog, you know, that goes after squirrels, it's uh -huh. anything more interesting and they're off on a tangent. Mm -hmm. and all of us feel like doing that. Yeah. And so probably more than one or two of us have sat through long, boring sermons where we'd rather be thinking about <laughs> anything else. But if we feel like God may still want to teach us something through the boring sermon, we try to stay focused and put some extra mental effort into thinking about how it might apply, mm -hmm. right? We do the work, uh -huh. um, but it's still hard. Well, that mm -hmm. difficulty you've had with a boring class or a sermon, um, that's the way the ADHD person feels most of the time. Mm -hmm. That's an important distinguish. That, that makes sense. That's helpful for the way I understand it. Um, I also, this, is, this was kind of shocking for me when I first read it, and I, I don't know much about it. But with like a Adderall, I know it's illegal in places like maybe I think the UK and some places in Asia like Japan um, because of the amphetamines. Um, do you know much about about Adderall or amphetamines and, and their the Well, there's different stimulants that are used for ADHD and some are, you know, the ones that are safest uh, are are typically prescribed for this condition. Hmm. But we've been using stimulants to improve self-regulation and alertness for a long time. Pilots in World War II were given stimulants on those long flights across the Atlantic. And one of the early myths that you sometimes still hear pediatricians voice is that stimulants will interfere with your ability to be focused unless you have ADHD. That's not the case. Stimulants help unless you get too much, right? It helps everyone stay focused. Um, it helps improve our alertness. But with people with ADHD, they have such a deficit in this area that they need stimulants to self-regulate so they have normal, or closer to normal self-regulation abilities. And in fact, that's the only thing that really alters the direct uh, attention itself. Everything else is prosthetic. So you help the child pay more attention by increasing how interesting the classes, you mm. increase feedback to keep them on task. You're, you have a prosthetic environment that compensates for it. You can get normal range performance if someone's mild to moderate with good behavioral control in the environment. But if you wanna see them self-regulate, the medication's the only thing that does that. Mm. You can teach someone in neurofeedback and other kinds of training, attention control training techniques to stay focused um, while you're teaching them that. And what the research shows is that then when they go ahead into the future, even though they can repeat that focus skill, if you ask them to again, 
in a similar sort of training condition, when they go ahead in the future, it's all lost. They know how to do it, but mm -hmm. they just don't do it. So it's not a skill deficit. It is a self-regulation deficit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's come back to um, this idea that stimulant use is somehow drug, drug use. So the illicit use of these kinds of products is a problem all over the place. Mm -hmm. People crushing Adderall and snorting and that sort of thing. But what we find with a truly ADHD population is if you effectively medicate them, the chance of comorbid drug addiction or abuse is reduced. It doesn't increase. Interesting. So some people in the substance abuse field would see people with ADHD that were using medications to self-medicate ineffectively. And they would think, well, we have to get them off all medicines. We can't put them on any kind of stimulant because that would you know, feed the drug addiction. But uh -huh. what the research shows is just the opposite, that effective medication of ADHD uh, reduces the likelihood of substance abuse. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there, wouldn't, there couldn't be individual cases. This yeah. goes back to our discussion earlier. We mm -hmm. have to make different decisions. But as a rule, it doesn't seem to be a gateway for substance abuse in mm -hmm. people that have ADHD. Now, can people abuse it? So college students taking Adderall just to do performance enhancement that don't have ADHD. Sure, that happens. But mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that some people abuse medications doesn't mean they shouldn't be used for what they're, yeah. what they're designed and better uh, attended for, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so if the medication helps you to self-regulate, um, is that something that someone with ADHD will have to take throughout the course of their lifetime or does it seem to? So that's a good question. I think it depends on severity and it depends on demands mm -hmm. in the environment. So there are certain situations if someone isn't so doesn't have severe ADHD mm -hmm. where the where they may not be particularly taxed in these skills. Mm -hmm. Say one year you have a really, really interesting, fascinating teacher, your classmates all are focused and helping you stay engaged. Mm -hmm. And someone with mild to moderate ADHD seems to do okay without any medication. Then the next year they have a boring teacher, they have classmates that are a problem, they don't like the subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly now they have ADHD. I often have parents come and say, it must be the teacher. Well, they're right in a way, but the other students are still succeeding okay with this boring teacher. Uh -huh. okay, but so what's going on with that? Well, it's because they're more vulnerable to the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have someone who's severe, we did see people with severe, moderate to severe ADHD at our research clinic. We saw some people who were in a special uh, educational program at Hollow and Rately, the Driven to Distraction People's program. Mm -hmm. um, when you have more severe ADHD, um, you can do all the right behavioral things and there's still going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's just the nature of the disorder. But you can you do what you can. Hopefully you'll make it at least a little bit less of a problem. No. Okay. And so uh, where do you see, let's see, can you, you also, didn't you get a doctorate in philosophy, I think? No, I have a master's in philosophy. Master's in philosophy. Um, so I did that because I thought, when I thought about how to relate Christianity and psychology, my undergraduate degree at Taylor University, which was a Christian school, was mm. a double major in psychology and philosophy of religion. And it seemed to me like a lot of the challenges or questions between how you think Christianly about psychology had to do with philosophical issues. Mm. So I felt like that was the missing link. That's what took me to Bowling Green. So they have the world's first applied philosophy program. Mm. So their focus in their master's program was on learning philosophy that could be applied to other fields. So I actually did a nine month practicum at a community mental health center in the philosophy program. Oh, nice. Before I was ever in psych, that was my first experience. Oh. Uh, and I did a thesis on an ethical argument for collaboration between ministry and community mental health organizations. Mm. And there, Ken Pargament, who was in our psych program at Bowling Green, a Jewish psychologist doing research on religion and coping, agreed to be on my thesis committee in philosophy. So I planned to go to Fuller when I was done, another a Christian program. Uh -huh. But his work on religion and coping, I really felt called to continue that. It was on his research team before I was in the program. And so I applied and I got into their program and decided to stay. Mm -hmm. So that's how that journey played out. But 
I've continued to teach philosophy on the side as an adjunct until COVID. So that's when my philosophy teaching ended. So mm. now that I'm in this role, I don't know if I'll do it, but I've been a adjunct philosophy prof in addition to my psychology career for 30 years or so. Oh, wow. So, yeah, uh, Carl Jung, he was, he talked about how philosophy and psychology are just hand in hand. You can't really do one without the other. Yeah, I don't, I feel that way at times and I have friends that are interested in philosophical psychology that say things like that. Mm. I think it's probably not true. Okay. However, to, to if you want to expand the field, if you want to ask boundary questions, like you're doing when you're asking, how does psychology and Christianity fit together? Uh -huh. Those are philosophical questions. So. Uh -huh. Most psych programs grew up in philosophy departments. Mm -hmm. William James, for instance, launched the psych program and then it became a separate department at Harvard out of their philosophy department. And so really what psychology was is a scientific attempt to ask questions in ethics and philosophy of mind mm -hmm. that people have been trying to settle through philosophical methods for thousands of years. And it was just an attempt to use the new laboratory sciences to ask questions about about psychological things. Mm -hmm. so psychology isn't new, but scientific psychology, this attempt to use scientific methods to answer it is pretty new. So mm -hmm. most people trace it back to Wilhelm Wundt, to, you know, the lab in Leipzig, Germany in the 1800s. There was a Jesuit scholar 100 years before that who had conceptualized something like this, but he didn't really develop it. So, but it is a very modern kind of enterprise, and that's what leads to it. So most of psychological science is being worked out on a playing field defined in the 19th century by philosopher physicians people that were interdisciplinary that were trying to answer questions in their fields with this new method of experimental science so that's where we are so so most of us inherit the playing field defined for us by people who had a philosophy 150 200 years ago mm -hmm. And that's why we're a little bit uncritical about this. I will tell you, uh, I will tell you, let you in on uh, some, I would say water cooler talk, except it's college campus. So don't nice, I'm ready. Talk. Um, so when our philosophy students at the State University went to, would go to parties that the psychology graduate students at, mm. were at, the philosophy people would come back and often say things like, those are the smartest dumb people I've ever met. <laughs> And that's because, you know, to get into the psych programs at Bowling Green, you had to have really high GPAs and good GRE scores, especially the IO program. That was the top IO program in the country. So a lot of the people were nearly perfect GPAs or 1400s under that system of the GREs. And, but they, they were doing the field with blinders on the way it was defined mm -hmm. for them. Uh -huh. And they didn't see how that those disciplinary identities were defined by a certain era of philosophy. Uh -huh. The philosophy students knew that, but uh -huh. the philosophy students weren't as academically bright mm. as these folks. So yeah. that's that's what they were reacting to. <laughs> Interesting. So, so these were very bright people who inherited a field that was predefined from a very narrow period of history. Mm -hmm. And they just assumed that's just the way you do it. You know, so is that why you say that you don't you don't know that you believe philosophy and psychology can't be divorced from one another? Well, because there are areas where you can just take the field as it's inherited uh -huh. and do meaningful things for a career. Uh -huh. But if you want to really have a psychology of the human person, uh -huh. you want to fully understand what it makes what it means to have a person, what is consciousness, those big kinds of boundary questions, mm -hmm. there's no way you can do it without engaging the bigger philosophical issues. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. You just can't. But yeah. if you want to help people overcome treatment refractory unipolar depression or help someone adjust to chronic pain, you can pretty much stay in the lane of the field as it's been inherited. Yeah, that makes sense. And so you have a, let's see, kind of switch into that. You have an extensive interest with Christianity and with psychology and with philosophy, and you've, you've written books on, on these subjects, right? Yeah, that's been where most of my work has been since coming to Regent and okay. really why I started college. Okay. So do you have any uh any more book plans? Well, uh Mark Yarhouse, who you know was a long-term professor with us now in adjunct, um, and I finished a book that we held in university for a little over a decade. So oh. one of the good things out of COVID, we were able to finally get that out. Oh, good. And it's meant to be a new primer intro text in how to integrate psychology and Christianity. 
we do make a few novel contributions there, but not so much trying to lay new new trails mm -hmm. as much as point out where the field has come from, get a good clear snapshot of where it is. And we take a domain-based approach in that book where we, we talk about different areas of activity where people think of how to be a Christian or how to take a Christian approach in those areas. So for instance, in developing theories about a person, psychological theories, uh -huh. how do we have a Christian approach to that? Hmm. Or in uh, worldviews. So what are the basic worldview assumptions? This is the kind of thing psychologists don't usually think much about. They just uh -huh. operate in the inherited worldviews in the field. Uh -huh. So, But certainly from a Christian standpoint, worldview is a big deal. So thinking that through, how do you have a Christian engagement with psychology that's faithful to a Christian worldview? or applied things how do you do clinical work in a way that draws on the resources of the christian faith but is still professionally ethical and competent um, roles so you're not just trained to do things in psychology to give a whisk you're trained to operate in a certain way so for instance you can't just hear something really interesting from a client then go and talk about it at the bar at night right so it's it's we have confidentiality boundaries why is that? Well, because we developed under these kind of medical models that have these kinds of trust building kind of things that are important and legal obligations and ethical obligations have been defined around that as part of the nature of the sort of contract between the client and the therapist. Mm -hmm. And so there's roles that you're inculcated into. And some of those roles can create some unique challenges for a Christian. So what if the client to be happier um, wants to choo choose a life choice that might be out of line with a Christian vision of what's morally acceptable for a person's mm -hmm. life. Well, are we there as a minister with a relig religio legal role saying, thou shalt, thou shalt not? Mm -hmm. Are we there as a clinician? Are we there as clinicians who are merely hedonic engineers? So we'll just tinker under the hood until you're happier and that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. That's what decides everything. Uh, so if you're like Tony Soprano and you're you know, you're killing people, but you're anxious about it. We help you get over the panic attacks. So you can be more effective. Uh, <laughs> boss. You know, so is that what we're doing? And so those are roles that we have to think through, but mm -hmm. this is not unique. It's a challenge that the church has had going back to its earliest inception and that the Jews had in the biblical tradition before that. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the ancient uh, Christian uh, writers talked about whether or not soldiers that became a Christian during the time of Rome should lead, should go AWOL, should essentially abandon their military duties. Mm -hmm. If not, they'd be serving this pagan empire that was persecuting at times Christians. Mm -hmm. And the resolution was different. Some people did say that Christians should just be pacifists, but probably the major view that evolved and really was embraced for most of Christian history is the major Christian position is that you can stay in these kinds of roles in civic societies, but you have to still be constrained in how you do it. Mm -hmm. So there are ethical ways to be a soldier and unethical ways. And a Christian has to figure out how to navigate those different roles. Mm -hmm. So Augustine gave this advice to a Roman general who after he became a Christian was thinking of leaving his, uh, he didn't have to go, hey, well, he could have retired. But Augustine said, why don't you stay in and be an example, but but do things in a Christian way. And he gave some examples of what that might mean. Mm. So that's an issue of role integration. So how do we function in psychology or another mental health field in a way that is faithfully and with integrity discharging the role that profession expects mm -hmm. and at the same time not compromise as disciples of Christ what we're doing? Yeah. And it may be confusing for the church sometimes if you make those choices, right? So if you're a sniper, and you shoot someone out in the field that doesn't know you're even there, mm -hmm. uh, that might be difficult for a pacifist Christian to understand. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm not trying to arbitrate pacifism yeah. versus military participation for Christians. Yeah. What I'm saying is this is not a new issue. Mm -hmm. So psychologists that enter the mental health fields say, we want to be in that venue as Christians, having a Christian influence. Mm -hmm. We think we can bring additional resources, we think we may help the field itself as members of the field not evolve in a way that is an enemy of the faith. Mm -hmm. and, and so you're there with those kinds of rationales usually, but there are difficult things to think through. And there could be times where just as those Roman soldiers that became Christians had to think through, you have to decide I can't be here anymore, or I have to 
disobey. I would just say this, since we agree voluntarily to operate under professional regulations when we enter this field, mm -hmm. I don't think a Christian can stay in a regulated mental health field as a psychologist or anything else, intentionally deciding to disobey a hard requirement of the field mm -hmm. because they think the Bible commands them to. Uh -huh. I think if you if you get to the point of that choice, the thing with integrity, once you've exhausted all other options to remedy the conflict, mm -hmm. is to say, okay, I have to resign my license then. Mm -hmm. I can't be in this field anymore. But that's my own view. I mean, so not everyone may think that way. It just seems to me that whatever else it means to be a Christian in a field where you voluntarily agree to operate by some standard, like a state license law or a code of ethics in a profession, yeah. is that you should follow that standard with integrity and if you can't because of a faith values conflict then you should no longer be in that identity mm. so that's that that's what i would argue there so that we talk about that in a role integration that we end by talking about personal integration which is um you know we're not just psychologists it's us being the psychologists so you're in third year so you've been to the training you know that you have to learn how to make who you are work in the clinical room, how to relate to clients, how to convey empathy the way you convey it. If you never really were a tearful person and, and a supervisor tells you, look, the waterworks have to flow when a client's in distress, uh -huh. you know, the client is not going to experience that as congruent empathy, right? Uh -huh. They're going to know you're like you've just sprayed yourself with a spray gun or something. Pension like, myself. You know, right, you know, they're going to know it's fake. Yeah. And so you have to learn to convey empathy in a way that's congruent with who you are. Mm. Sometimes, yes, we do need to stretch and grow so we can be a little bit different to be effective clinicians, but the best clinicians use who they are effectively with clients. Um, and I think, I think that's like that with integration. So learning how to be a Christian in psychology or another mental health field is learning how to grow as a Christian, as a disciple of Christ in your personal life in a way that fits with your professional roles too. So that's a, that's a challenging discipleship journey. Again, no different than any other field has. If you're a military lawyer or a, you know, you're defending uh, criminal defendants, what do you do with that if you're in, uh, in, in uh, law and you're a Christian, right? So that those things are challenges other fields face too. But by thinking about them explicitly, we can at least draw on what are some of the insights other people have learned and not have to start from scratch each time. So that was the point of our book. One of the things we've toyed with is uh, this was a kind of primer in this area. Maybe now we see if InterVarsity or someone else wants to do a series of books where we take each of these domains and do kind of a a full length book on each of the domains with more cutting edge advanced oh, stuff. That would be good. So we'd have like a book on theoretical integration, book on worldview. There's already some good books on how to do practice mm -hmm. in an integrative way, but still have a book there that could be a little more advanced and offering case edited. studies and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of, if I do another thing, that's probably what we're looking at, but. They should do it. <laughs> What's well, we'll the. See. <laughs> the one that you just got done finishing, what's the title of that one? So it's the Integration of Psychology and Christianity, a okay. Domain-Based Approach. Okay. And when and is that due to be released? It was actually just released in August. It's available through InterVarsity. Right? Okay. I'll put a link on the, on the video. Oh, great. Yeah. So. All right, Dr. Hathaway, this has been very informative. I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thanks for the discussion and your interest in psychology. So it's a, the field got reinvented a few times since I've been in it. It's mm. going through another reinvention now. So it's, you know, you folks coming up, it's your job to kind of take the, uh, the ball down the field now in this new playing turf. We will, we will do our best. <laughs> All right. Very good.